Hello and welcome back to Guillotine 18th Century Tennis Theater. Today we're going to talk about the contributions of Dalton, Crooks, and Thompson, all three of which contributed much to early atomic theory. Again, most of their ideas are no longer relevant today, but the reason we're learning about these is that they added to the knowledge of atoms at the time, each one of them getting us that much closer to what we think about atoms today. And so we'll talk about Dalton's billiard ball model of the atom, not that different from Democritus's model. We'll talk about the cathode ray tube and how that helped advance J.J. Thompson's plum pudding model, our second model of the atom, and really our first novel view of the atom since Democritus's uh, Atomus model. And so what John Dalton really did was sort of gathered up all the information that people had known and discovered since Democritus and created five principles. Now, again, many of these are not all that different than what Democritus thought of, but they did incorporate some of the thoughts of the time, including his own, based on the law of multiple proportion. But nowadays, these might not seem all that impressive, but what is impressive that is that uh, some of these have held uh, and stood up to the test of time. So the five principles are that atoms are indivisible and indestructible, atomos, uh, that given elements, uh, atoms are the same, that different elements have different atoms, and that uh, chemical compounds are formed by simple whole number ratios. That's akin to his law of multiple proportions. And that atoms cannot be subdivided, created, or destroyed. And so what we're going to do is we're going to dim out the ones that are still relevant today. But, but three of these have been disproven. Uh, the ones that have not been disproven are the ideas that different atoms uh, have different physical and chemical properties. And that chemical compounds are formed by small whole number ratios. The remaining three, one, two, and five, have all been disproven over time. And so let's talk about some of the facts that show that these are no longer relevant. We, we know that atoms are divisible um, into subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons, and even particles smaller than that. And you've grown up knowing that, but they didn't know that at the time. Uh, number two sounds like an easy bet, the idea that atoms of the same element are the same, but through the discovery of isotopes, which we'll talk a little bit more about later in this unit, uh, atoms of the same element can actually be a little different because they have different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. Now again, you can't really fault Dalton too much for this. He didn't even know about uh, the divisible atom, much less the idea of neutrons in the nucleus, much less the idea that there could be different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. So we can certainly forgive him of that. And again, even five atoms cannot be subdivided, created, nor destroyed when involved in chemical reactions. Uh, there are many ways to change atomic composition. We do gain or lose electrons in chemical reactions, and all bets are off when we have a nuclear reaction going on. But still, two out of five from something created at the, in the early 19th century is really not too bad of a deal. And Dalton's model of the atom would stay until technology came along, and that would advance people's understanding of the atoms. Again, atoms are tricky to study, and so the trick was to find some kind of experiment or observation at the macro level of experience, at our level of experience, that would give us information about what's going on inside atoms, which obviously we could not appear directly in. And so along came Sir William Crookes, and he created the cathode ray tube in the late 19th century. Uh, and the important thing about the cathode ray tube is that uh, it gave an insight to what was going on inside atoms. And so what it did was called the cathode ray tube is because they had two, an they had two uh, anodes or two electrodes, one cathode and one anode. And when hooked up to a high voltage charge, uh, a beam would appear at the cathode and, and travel towards the anode. And this ray could be bent by electrical and magnetic fields. Now we know today that this beam was electrons, uh, but uh, at the time they didn't know what that was. But by studying the cathode ray tube in a lot of different ways, uh, people were able to realize and start to delve into what was coming out of the atoms in the anode and cathode. Now, the, the CRT, besides being used to help form modern atomic theory, uh, would form uh, what we would consider the oscilloscope. So anytime you see one of those heart rate monitors with a little dot that's going up and down, at least in the original days, that was caused by a cathode ray hitting a certain screen that would phosphoresce. Uh, the original TV, if you have an old TV, an old tube TV, the thick kind, that had a cathode ray in it also that was directed, and that would again hit things that would phosphoresce on the screen, the inner screen of the tube, which is why when you turned off an old TV, it always shrunk down to that single dot and then disappeared as the, as the ray died down. It's also why old TVs are hard to record because that cathode ray actually went across the screen and painted the picture one line at a time. And if you didn't get the uh, refresh rate or the, uh, uh, the hertz rate, then 
you, it would not look right when you videotaped it. So some little TV trivia there. I'll try to put some links to some cathode ray, uh, cathode tube uh, videos in the bottom of this, by the way. Sir William Crooks would actually also do other things. He'd go on to uh, head the Royal Society for a bit, eventually encouraging the works of Fritz Haber, who would uh, create nitrogen fixation and eventually lead to uh, artificial fertilizers, which is the only reason why this planet can support the population it has, but I digress. William Crooks did other things too. Now, the person who came along and, and jumped on what Crooks did was J.J. Thompson. J.J. Uh, Thompson uh, studied the electric fields in the CRT in 1897. Now, he did not actually come up with the term electron. That was coined by another scientist earlier in the study of electric currents. But what J.J. Thompson did is he thought that the electrons might actually be tiny sub subatomic particles, corpuscles as he called them, uh, that could be produced from all these different metals. And so what Thompson did would really uh, alter the story of humanity, really, because J.J. Thompson would be the first one since Democritus, really, the first one to ever think about atoms in a way differently than anybody else ever had. And so by looking at the CRT, he was actually able to come up with enough evidence to disprove the idea that atoms were indivisible. And so this was a big idea. And so it really comes down to two ideas. He reasoned that since he could, he could produce these electrons as cathode ray from any substance, then atoms had to be divisible because these, these negatively charged particles had to come out of the metal. And so if they came out of the metal, that means they must have been in the metal in the first place. And that would have been big enough. That was a big idea that, you know, once we get particles out of atoms, well, they were, in, they were divisible. But the neat idea was, well, well, wait a minute, atoms are neutral. If I can reach into this and pull out a negative particle, well, if you think about it, it, it makes sort of sense that there must be something positive left behind. And so J.J. Thompson realized that not only was there a negative particle that we could get out of the atom, but there must be something positive left behind. And so that ended up being really a one-two punch to, to end the billiard ball model. J.J. Thompson would experiment, he would continue looking into this, and he would later confirm the existence of that positive force. Now we know today those are protons, um, but he didn't know that at the time. And so J.J. Thompson went, came up with a model of the atom to reflect the idea that you could get electrons out of it. And so he came up with what, uh, with, which what something that was called uh, the plum pudding model. Now we don't really eat much plum pudding nowadays except for around the holidays. Um, we call it we call it figgy pudding in the uh, carols, uh, but the idea was that inside this this ball of dough were uh, raisins suspended, uh, and and he said, okay, well atoms are sort of like this, and the electrons are not the plum, the plum's a flavoring, uh, the electrons are like raisins embedded inside of it. It'd sort of be like if we discovered this today, we might call this the the grapes and jello model, with the grapes being the electrons suspended in the hazy positive charge. Now again, that picture might look unfamiliar because it's not our modern view of the atom. And so uh, what that does is that leaves us to get to the next model of the atom, which will be the planetary model. And the planetary model is where uh, a lot of people end their journey into atomic history, but it is certainly not the correct view of the atom. So why is everybody taught a model of the atom? That's not really the way it is. Well, we'll find out next time. And so I appreciate you watching. I hope you've enjoyed yourself and have a great day.